Hey everybody, this is our Johannes Mattis Conrad speaking. The Great Johannes is the name of my podcast. I uh, was suspended from using TikTok Live Studio yesterday because I had been showing some uh, uh, YouTube videos. Apparently, this tool allows you to play videos and screens and so on, and game screens or whatever. And in my case, uh, because I showed like two, th two or three minutes of a, of a clip of a YouTube video, uh, uh, I was suspended for 24 hours. So this is a bit odd, you know, TikTok gives you this live studio that you can download for your desktop or for your laptop computer. And then you can uh, show all sorts of things like videos, play music, show uh, application screens and so on. But now it's not entirely clear to me what exactly TikTok calls reproduced content, reproduced content, meaning anything that you, if I would show videos from YouTube or elsewhere, probably TikTok itself as well, then apparently you get a strike for it and they take away your live, uh, live access. How are you doing? I'm just, uh, for those of you joining, I'm just doing a little chit chat, a little debate, a little discussion here and there. Uh, no defined topic, just a little, a little bit of slow chat. I had a bit of a flu, I suppose. Yes, the hat. Yeah. It's a fedora hat. I'm trying to promote hat wearing. Uh, normally, I wouldn't wear it indoors, but um, you can hear, you can wear a hat in public spaces, basically, and uh, not necessarily in private spaces. But for the for the videos I make, I'm going to start wearing a hat, so I become a little bit more uh, recognizable. I want to talk about anything that uh, comes up in me. And that is um, this basic argument where they always say that, oh, immigrants are going to multiply. They're going to have um, greater numbers in the Western world and the white people are going to become minorities, right? But then, of course, um, there are trillions and trillions of ants and termites on this planet, right? And very few lions by comparison. But no one calls ants the kings of the jungle. It's not our job to be the majority of anything. Uh, white people have never been a majority on Earth, globally speaking. Uh, the Asians and the Indian, basically, the Asiatic type people have always been the majority. Even Africans today in Africa, although they have a booming population and they will double before the end of the century, they are not going to be a global majority still the Asians will remain a global majority. And white people, at the height of the colonial age, I think we were 33%, 40% of the global population because we had a baby boom, uh, several generations, several centuries of baby booming going on. And the thing with that is uh, we were fine a thousand years ago when we were 50 million or so or 2000 years ago, you know, when, when there were maybe, I don't know, 30 million people living in all of Europe, we were fine throughout the ages. It was never a competition for, for quantity, not to us. It was a competition for quality, for, you know, foresight, genius, you know, work ethic, perhaps, you know, it's just wrong to keep framing it in the, in terms of, oh, we're becoming minorities and therefore powerless. I would argue exactly the opposite. If we become minorities in our own countries, that will actually make us more powerful because we get to focus on quality over quantity. If you see the, you know, mass humanity, of course, is a problem. Mass humanity, by definition, uh, is hyper specialized. It also means that normal people, uh, they no longer have the skills that our ancient ancestors used to have. I argue that our ancestors were more competent, if not also more intelligent than we are today. They were not as trained in, say, corporate corporate logic or so, or corporate sol problem solving. But in the past, an ordinary, ordinary man needed to be able to work an axe. He needed to be able to be a carpenter to fix his house. He needed to be able to thatch his own roof. Uh, he needed to make buckets. If your buckets broke down, you couldn't go to a store and make a bucket or buy a bucket. You had to make them yourself. You needed to know all about woodwork. Maybe you had a friend in town who was a smith or something, but other than that, you would have to do almost everything on your own. Men of the past, therefore, were far more competent and knowledgeable about 
uh, how to organize a household, for example. There are men nowadays in the modern time who couldn't change a light bulb. They call an electrician to change a light bulb. Okay? Uh, there are people who, who call cleaning staff to help clean their house, or even if they have a small house. This is weird. Um, a lot of people are so hyper-specialized, they only know how to do their job well. Well, say you're in a, I don't know, you work at an office as a secretary or something, and you know all about clocking people in or checking people in and out of the building. But that's really all you know how to do, and you don't know. You don't know how to do a little bit of electric wiring, and you don't know how to do... Uh, how to sharpen your knives, for example. You have to take your knives to someone to help you sharpen your knives. Why don't you do it yourself? Or about baking bread. Who knows how to bake bread? I don't really eat bread that much, but I suppose I'd figure it out, you know? Um, and of course, this uh, notion of competency is most important in, in lives of people. You know, human beings are supposed to be very competent, but the way we raise our children nowadays, uh, we tell them no a lot. Every time you see small children, when you have family and you have children, you see, you see children trying to explore the world, and that is in most cases the indoor world of the house, because when they're one or two years old, they're crawling over the floor and so on, and they want to explore and they want to work with the things that they see others work with. Say you have, I don't know, a bag of potatoes in your kitchen and your toddler crawls over and wants to touch the potatoes what does mommy say he says no no but the kid of course saw you use the potatoes and wants to find out what they are what the hell are potatoes anyway in the past your kids would be crawling out on the farm outside in the summer and they would see you handling potatoes or uh, harvesting potatoes your two-year-olds would come and help you harvest the potatoes they would understand what that these these things come from the soil they would then see mommy chop up the potatoes to make a soup or something, potato soup or whatever, right? And so children in the past were much, much more exposed to the competencies of their parents, and they were allowed and encouraged even to very quickly adopt these uh, competencies. I went hiking once in northern Sweden, and I came past this site in the middle of nowhere, and I call it the Arctic jungle. It looked like File Thailand, where you have these massive rock walls with waterfalls coming down in the summer. You have that in northern Sweden as well. And it's just so beautiful. And I, I, I stopped at a sign that explained someone's personal life story who had grown up there, one of the, uh, the Laplander people of northern Scandinavia. And she wrote, she explained on that sign uh, that when she was four years old, she was allowed to go to the stream by herself with a bucket of water, she knew how to fish, right? She knew how to cook fish. She knew how to bake bread all by age four. And although she said that she had to do a lot of things on her own at that age, right? Um, she felt incredibly free. And exactly that is the point. The more competent you are, the more you know how to do things, the freer you are. First of all, you save yourself a lot of expenses. You don't have to call the electrician to help you uh, exchange a light, light bulb, right? Um, competent people can do more in their lives. They are less dependent on others. And if you make acquiring competencies your goal in life, right, then you are going to, uh, you know, well, become a lot more successful in every way. And, and it doesn't have to be financial, uh, simply successful in, in every way. And financial is just one way. We live in the money cult, in the, the cult of the god Mammon, the money god who tells us that our whole lives revolve around making money. But really, that means we are doing work for others rather than for ourselves, right? Uh, someone says that they make bread. That's great. I recently uh, started buying whole chickens from the supermarket instead of buying just the meat. And that means at home, I started uh, yeah, butchering the chicken, basically cutting it up. In, into eight pieces or so and figuring out how to do things like that it's an important skill that you know you know what is what you know you know what to do things here you know bro i am from africa and your videos are popping up every day in in the for you page well great though at least you're listening huh? 
learned helplessness, yeah, that's another issue. And it's mainly because modern parents in the Western world, they tell their children, no, no, you can't do that. No, uh, you know, like there, it's this denial of exploration. Young people need to very quickly, very rapidly learn all there is to learn so they can become more independent. But this is precisely what modern societies don't want. They don't want you to become independent. They want you to be dependent on father, state, and mommy media, as I call it. Or nowadays, some kind of queer communist conspiracy, you know? Here, this is why someone taught their children how to grow a garden and how to cook. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Hey, Jones, what do you say to people who say the white race doesn't exist and just made up? Well, they don't exist and they are just made up, you know, just shrug it off. You know, who cares what these people think, man? I'm a proud descendant of the kings and family from Scotland and Ireland in the USA. Well, I, I like Scottish and Irish people out. They're very short. The Irish are very short. But, you know, Scotland, man, have you ever been there? I've been hiking there once as well and skiing once. I skied once in, at, near Aviemore in Scotland. Oh, oh it's so beautiful there. But it, the air is so fresh. That's the first thing you notice when you come from a big city on mainland Europe and you go to rural Scotland. <laughs> oh, the air is so fresh. You just don't want to leave anymore. Yeah? I refuse for us to be a dying breed. Again, this is what I mean. Why do you say dying breed? White people have now, uh, depending on the definition, somewhere between 800 and 1.1 billion people on Earth. A thousand years ago, maybe we had 200 million. 2,000 years ago, we had like 50 million. How are we a dying breed? We, we, we have tremendous numbers, way more than we need. And that's the real problem. The problem isn't that we have too few of us. The problem is that there are too many of us. So we cannot be decisive. We cannot be... Uh, what, we, what we need is more decision-making, rapid decision-making, where we can very quickly adapt to new situations. And mass immigration is simply one more situation you adapt to. You can become the rulers of these newcomers. We can become the kings, the ruling class, for example. We can do something else and become, say, a separate warrior class that stands on its own. Yeah? We can leave and colonize the subarctic and other territories that may thaw up or if the other thing happens which is what i think will happen though is that europe may get a small a small new ice age which would also be great then we learn to deal with the cold and many other people the tropical kinds they won't want to live here anymore especially not if the wealth dries up what do you think if you know they did a questionnaire in turkey in, uh, in germany once they asked they asked turkish people what would you do if the welfare payments stopped today most of them said they would simply leave and go back to turkey so they're only here for the money so the sooner the economies dry up the better actually because you know our people aren't going to leave where where are we going to go to if if the western world goes uh if the economies collapse so to speak that would be a good thing for us because then we can start to reorganize everything we can you know cut the fat trim the fat so to speak right the excess fat we keep some fat but the excess fat can leave and that way we will be we'll be fine you know i mean i don't see i think one more one more psychological problem of the western leadership is that we we live merely to grow the economy and therefore we don't care if it's uh if we have immigrants or not but of course, other people like me care more about the culture, the civilization, the ideas, the people, right? The heart, the soul, the mind, right? What goes on inside of us, right? And that, I think we are going to witness this transformation this century. The transformation where we realize that worshiping money was like worshiping the golden calf. And we don't need to do that anymore. We can focus so much more on everything else, which is so much, the spiritual connection, like the cosmic depth that you find within your own heart and mind there. Right? Um, and to go in there and then have a sort of, I call it the revival of the West, but of course I don't mean a revival of the economy. I mean a revival of the spirit of the West, of the Western people. The soul of the Western people must come back to life. We are really dormant in a sense. We are sleeping um, because we are so robotic in our jobs. We go to work nine to five, right? It's so mechanical and so... You know, you're educated to do your job right, right? And you're told to do, you're, you're being told what to do on the job. You're not really required to have too much thinking of your own or have too much creativity, right? 
uh, and it becomes a system of a system of bossiness where everybody wants to be everybody else's boss all the time not because they're better or more competent but basically that's the only way to get more money to get people below you right all of that is really weird uh we need um we need what the european elites used to call uh, a noblesse oblige right to, to be noble and to be a ruler means you have an obligation to your people to fight and win wars for them cultural wars right even if it costs money the whole point of a culture war is that you are willing to spend money on it to win it rather than avoid culture wars because you'd rather save money and then what buy a boat buy a yacht like Zelensky you got two big yachts now isn't that insulting though you know that Zelensky gets two two yachts while 15 year old white non-Jewish Ukrainians are sent to die in a meat grinder it's so unfair you know the Faustian spirit exactly that's what we need more of the boundless men and the fearless women right to go from to go to infinity i'm from germany and sand people only care about our money yeah exactly they only come for the money you know but what if they got to you know invest in in turn nothing really they just come to grab gives me that yeah it's not all right it's weird but i have seen a lot of support for the germans in world war ii in africa too much like a lot really okay i don't know why that is The Netherlands isn't a great place to have kids either. No, I don't think so. It's very urbanized. If you like healthy, fresh air, go to rural Scotland <laughs> or Scandinavia. What do you mean for fearless women? Oh, a phrase I use sometimes is boundless men and fearless women. Men should be independent, boundless, and women fearless in the sense that they can support their men and don't have to fear backlash from immigrants or something like that, you know. Uh, how tall am I? I'm six foot five hello from west africa viking woman okay <clears throat> uh, for those of you joining i'm just doing some random chit chat i don't i don't usually have something to say but i don't always have I don't always i don't always keep talking the whole time the good places to live in the netherlands are provinces like drenthe or friesland in the north yeah but for how long you know when they're going to turn the netherlands into the tri-state city that's this project uh invented by the dutch corporations and the uh, rich families i suppose they just want to maximize the population living in the netherlands because that's how the rich get rich they sell people subscriptions they sell people rent and housing and land and so on right uh and and products and, and food the supermarkets in the netherlands for example are also owned by a couple of rich families right by corporations basically they don't care about food waste they want you to waste food they want more people to come and to waste more food. They don't care about anything. They just want they just want money, you know. Yeah, I'm six foot five. Yeah. I suppose I don't know what the benefits of being really tall are, but I've never been attacked by anybody. I suppose that's a benefit. People tend to not not attack you if you're big. You know, freeze none, yeah minorities are helpless victims and well that's how they see themselves yeah. they see themselves as victims yeah you know when they say like oh if only europeans hadn't come to europe then Af africa no sorry if, if only europeans hadn't come to africa then africa would have been like wakanda uh no they wouldn't have been africans <laughs> because when we found them they were starving if we hadn't come we wouldn't you know if we hadn't brought their people over to to the united states and so on and actually fed them and housed them they wouldn't have lived you know Who believes in climate change policies? Yeah. Make Wakanda great again. Yeah. It's really it's really the Lulu, like delusional. And although I suppose from the African perspective, you are a young race of people that only recently woke up from history, and you are faced with civilizations everywhere, India, you know, China, Europe above all, right? Uh, Russia and, and 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 the Americas and they all these civilizations were more advanced than yours. You are the late comers to the scene. You never did anything really, you, nothing. You you didn't even invent the wheel. You didn't even have roads for wheel transportation anyway. You didn't build them, and and so you are ex you feel extremely insecure and extremely you know inferior, because you are. 
right? But to respond to that by then inventing your own fantasy history and by stealing other people's history to make it your own, and then especially white history, because you don't hear Africans say that they built this, uh, the Chinese wall or something. You, you hear them say that they, they was, we was Europeans. They, if they could crawl into our skin, they would do it. That is just so sad, you know? So I try to ignore this nowadays. I try to focus more on what can we Europeans now do and what's going to come at us, you know? Yeah, you know the whole, someone says we need to be constantly apologizing. You know the whole, uh, the soccer players taking the knee for Black Lives Matters? My, I can't believe how long that went on. Why didn't they just quit doing these stupid things, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to get into it anymore. Like, we was Egyptians and shit, yeah. You know, because they, in, in the United States, they teach you that Africa is black. They don't teach you that North Africans and East Africans were never black. They are Semitic and Caucasian, Eurasian type people. They were never black. So, you know, it's all, it's all problematic. If you're not aware of that, if you don't understand that, or you're, if you're in denial of it, then, you know, nothing will become of you. So what can we Europeans do to promote our cause? In my view, it really doesn't matter how many numbers we have. We simply look at the numbers we do have, how many of them are young and fit and healthy, what can you do with them, where do you guide them, what do you, what do you tell them to do, basically? And so I have several ideas. I've spoken about this at length in other videos. Uh, colonize the subarctic regions in case temperatures are indeed rising. You know, northern Scandinavia, northwest Russia, uh, Belarusia, and so on. Uh, Siberia, Alaska, Greenland, Antarctica, northern Canada. Lots and lots of these places will become more habitable, more conducive to human life. And we white people should be the first to simply go and colonize these places because that's what we do best. And that's what everybody calls us. They call us colonizers. Well, let's just live up to the, to the accusation though, no? and do what we do best. Um, there are other possibilities is to start thousands of small new ethno states like Orania and South Africa. That's just one, but we need thousands spread all over the world like the Mennonites and the Amish are doing. They seem to be thriving. The, the Amish and the Mennonites, they have thriving communities precisely because they reject technology. This may also be an idea for us that a good portion of us goes that way, like the Luddites rejecting technology, right? And what else can we do? We can make sure that we make ourselves the upper class, the ruling classes of the nations we have, even if we become minorities. Then more like, like in Brazil, for example, the ruling classes are white people and lots of Jews as well. But the point is, there's a niche there, right? We can, we can stay on top. The same way that in the Indian caste system, although they say it's not based on race or skin color, it is. The upper classes in India are the lightest, right? And... And if you read some, I read a book about the class, caste system in India, and it is based, it, they are biologically different. People from different castes are biologically different people. Like it's almost as though they are uh, separate uh, ethnicities, really, with their own languages even often. And, and so it is genetic. It is racial in this sense. And the lighter, more European types are in charge there. So, you know, Brahmins or Scythians, yeah. What do you think of the idea of active clubs? Uh, what do you mean by active club? Like places for people to join, like militias or something. Yeah, we need to get to know, get together and connect, of course, for the long term. But you know, in the short term now, the big problem is, of course, the problem of Israel. If you listen even to the to the American uh, political debates, you know they have elections coming up next year, right? So they're starting to do the debates already. And it's all about, like, if you don't support Israel, you're an anti-Semite. You know, if you're not, if you don't hate Iraq, then you're a terrorist. You know, if you, uh, if you're not with us, then you're with the enemy. That kind of, uh, that kind of language may still work in the USA, but not in Europe. We Europeans here, Americans say things like, you know, if you don't support Israel, you're an anti-Semite. Then, then we'd rather be anti-Semites then. What does the word what what does the word Semite even mean? Someone told me that in Arabic you have the word semia, which means supremacy. So Semitic peoples see themselves as the superior people. So if you don't believe they are superior, you're an anti-Semite. 
you're anti-supremacist. Basically, anti-Semitism means literally anti-supremacism. It's very funny that they they twist things like that. You know, why would you do that? You know, it worked in Tommy Robinson. I think Tommy Robinson is a Zionist. Yeah, he is Jewish, so of course he supports Israel. Yeah. Uh, space exploration is another option, but although I think actually terraforming uh, Venus and Mars is a far, far away, we don't even have the technology to really wear a spacesuit and walk on the moon surface. Really, doesn't even, you know? Can you imagine, you know, taking a doo doo in your space spacesuit? You know, what if that that system in your your that diaper you're wearing doesn't really work very well? You got the smell of it all throughout your spacesuit for for hours before you can refresh you know it's n it's not very realistic is it you know are you walter white i don't know who that is space is a lie i think space exists but it depends on what we can do with it i think the potential for space ex exploration is very far away from us you know they sent a, the Russians sent a monkey to space, but he died. And they also sent a, sent a dog, Laika, also died. And they sent people up there who also died. Yeah. And one of, one of the Russian cosmonauts returned and the spaceship, the, the shield burnt up and basically he arrived, burnt up. He died on Earth. Yeah. Parallel societies are a, oh, that's also an option. Yeah, parallel societies where we uh, disconnect, but uh, it will be a bit harder to do under the uh, the digital ID system. You would have to forfeit access to the internet in order to actually do a parallel society. But then again, before the internet, every war, every organization, every society was organized without the use of electronic tools, uh, without the use of the internet. So you don't, you know, you don't need the internet to win wars, all right? A new social contract. Uh, what is even our social contract today? The social contract in the Western world seems to be you work for money, you buy a house early, and then you watch your house appreciate in value. But of course, this doesn't work anymore. The contract is already voided. You can't buy a house, and even if you could, it will be so expensive, and then you can't watch it appreciate in value anymore because you bought it at the peak of the market. Uh, yeah, democracy is fake, you know. We need more of Hobbes' Leviathan than Rousseau's, yeah, socialism, I suppose, right? The French socialist, the French socialist, yeah. They messed up Europe, really. You know, the only reason why Germany united under von Bismarck is because the French were trying to subdue the Germans, so they united against the French, you know. If they if they had just left the Germans alone, Germany Germany would have been so so very different, you know. But that's how it is, right? I think we need more Habas. We need more Leviathan. I think we have actually Rousseau today. That's interesting that you think it's otherwise. Yeah? So, what are my opinions about the upcoming French elections? Well, the media are hiding the attacks from the just like in Ireland and everywhere. The media are hiding the the attacks, the rapes. The butchering, you know, the the awful, awful crimes committed against women and young people, men, people are being killed and stabbed. But then when they shoot one foreigner, one foreigner gets shot, and then all the foreigners riot like it's like it's Che Guevara against the, you know, that's so weird. I think again, France, yeah, Marine Le Pen is also a controlled opposition, just like Geert Wilders and and Maloney, all of them. They are all Israel first. They don't care about human beings, you know, they don't care about our people. That's also so strange about the whole political system in Europe. You, you don't seem to get access to it unless you are, are either Jewish or you support the Jews or Israel or Zion. Otherwise, you, you simply don't stand a chance. No, Maloney opened the borders to millions of, uh, of foreigners coming into Europe. I think she's a total con artist. I think she's a Zionist. I think she's Jewish. They don't care about us. This is the whole damn point. What happened? If you read books 
from the late 19th century, early 20th century, you can sense sometimes that our kind of people, the non-Jewish white people, were actually in charge of Europe during the 19th century, but that the Jews took over. Jewish, the urban elites, the urban cliques, they took over because the power in the world shifted from the rural, from the countryside to the cities. And in the cities, it's not the, uh, the Germanic warrior nobility that ruled the cities. In fact, they didn't even like the cities. They didn't want to live in the cities. Uh, they thought life in the city was so uh, immoral, they wouldn't even house their prisoners of war in a city. That's how, that's how bad they thought cities were. And those cities are now ruled by the very people who also rule all of Europe. We are living in the urban world, in, the, in an urban civilization that exploits the countryside uh, to its own end, you know. And this is so bad, you know. Someone said I called it that Meloni sounded too good to be true. Yes, she was. She's too good to be true. Yeah. Thoughts on Ian Stewart Donaldson's beliefs when he was still here. Uh, I have to Google him. Um, Ian Stewart Donaldson. What did he believe? You know, an English musician, frontman of the snow. I don't know anything about this guy, but you know. Yeah, Geert Wilders' father is like a Muslim Indonesian, right? So it's not, he's a bit of a stranger, a strange person. He's not going to do anything for us, you know. I think they allowed Wilders to win the election in the Netherlands to make him prime minister because he's going to be pro-Israel, pro-Zionist, and that's what uh, you know the Israeli people demand. Do you think we have uh, real democracies where we get to vote for something? First of all, the media are totally misinforming us, so most people most people cannot even possibly uh, begin to vote for their own self-interest because it's not allowed. You're you're allowed to vote for five candidates, and all of them support Israel, and none of them support you. Uh, what do you what do you vote for? Democracy is just a sham, you know. Because you see it everywhere in the news, you know. Everywhere you turn, you turn on news channels, it's all pro-Israel in the Western world, right? And they show you that we need to care for Palestinian victims, but you know, and to me, I can't. I just can't pick a side in this conflict. I don't care about Palestinians. And I don't care about the Israeli either. I find it weird that the global news media feel that this conflict is the most important one and not the mass immigration coming to Europe. Now that we hush up and we deny it and we ignore it, you know. That's just really strange. Do you think there are healthy countries left? No, but there are still some healthy people left. And with them, you will just have to work and found new nations or found new ways of life, you know. What about Trump, Donald Trump? Well, I liked Donald Trump, yeah, but I think he's also a supporter of Israel, isn't he? So you just don't have a choice. You have, like, they're all pro-Israel. Vivek is pro-Israel. You know, Nimarata, Nikki Haley is pro-Israel. Does it, you, can, you can vote for black people, brown women, or white guys, and they're all pro-Israel. So no one, absolutely no one says, you know, uh, we're going to do what's right. We're going to cut loose Israel. We're going to invest our resources in, in arming Europe to the teeth. And we are going to uh, have either have friendly diplomatic relations with Russia or we subdue Russia. Either way, we're going to get access to the Russian resources. I think we can do it through diplomacy, but only if we arm Europe to the teeth. right? And that's how it's just going to be. We're just going to have to accept the conflict with Russia. But then also through that conflict, we can make ourselves independent from the USA, you know. Yeah. Why is it we support Israel, but we won't use Israeli isolation policies? Yeah. You know, Europe is also strange. In Europe, we also we always complained about American isolationism, but now Europe is doing the same thing vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, when China is able to produce cheaper electric cars, which we say we need because of climate change, uh, and then Europe uh, throws a hurdle, 
couple of hurdles to China uh, because we meaning uh, import taxes and export taxes because we don't actually want to have people to buy the cheaper electric vehicle vehicles from China you know that's really extreme. I was just I'm looking at my Twitter feed see if anything's going on. Yeah, are people getting murdered? That's the first thing I see. <laughs> you know a lot of people with suits on in the media they uh they just and politicians do it's just their job it's really just their job there's a politician in the netherlands for some uh, very liberal party d66 666 right and the day he quit being a politician he quit <coughs> quit being active on twitter <coughs> he'd been very active on twitter as long as he was being paid right but when he was no longer getting paid to be on twitter or didn't have to be on twitter to receive his pay because they get severance pay, uh, they uh, he immediately quit Twitter. Meaning he never cared anything. He he never cared about anything he he ever said. It was all just work. It was just his job to be a leftist. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting paid 120k a year to be a leftist politician, just for money? And it's just your job. And privately, you do hate immigrants, for example, or you don't want immigrants. Isn't that strange? There are people like that. And in fact, there's a lot of them. These are the people who want to feel liked and loved by others, right? These are people who, uh, whose job it is simply to make other people believe things that aren't so. They get paid for it. They love their job, right? But only from nine to five. Privately, they are totally different people. You're dealing with con artists, actors, you know, it's like, you have an actor on screen, actors at a theater, right? And you have actors in parliament. They're also actors, you know? What do you think of the actual political situation in the Netherlands? The young people are starting to understand that mass immigration means that they can't get housing anymore. And so they're starting to get pissed off. But at the same time, you see the media are actively fighting the native Dutch people trying to humiliate us, debase us, make us feel inferior and, and bad or, or backward and so on, right? It's constant. Every day they are uh, demoralizing us, degrading us. And uh, I wonder if the Dutch people find the strength sometime to fight back, you know? At least, you know, they voted for Geert Wilders, even though most people don't understand that this guy is controlled opposition, but that's okay. At least they voted for a right-wing party. It means people are waking up and realizing that they are losing out. We are losing out. Uh, yeah, well, you don't have to have a high IQ to be extremely manipulative. You just have to be uh, unscrupulous and ruthless. All right and be more selfish that you only care about basically if you are if you are just a small group of people who are extremely racist though not very intelligent you know that's how it works you know right they practice solidarity which is denied white people because whenever we want to get organized they call us racist but when everybody else calls gets organized they call it progress see that's what it is you know it's just really bad. What do you like about Israel? Nothing. There is no democracy. It's just theater to give us a feeling of who we choose, right? Who we choose to govern us. Yeah, I think that's what you mean. Yeah. I feel like this is a preparation for national pride just before war. Yeah, of course. So Geert Wilders, what's he going to do? You know, he's going to give you a little bit of your uh, your culture here and there, right? And then he's going to say, oh, but you have to die in a war against Russia to save Israel. Yeah, President Wilders is just going to dunk people he doesn't care about in war. You know, that's what it's really about. Yeah. 
But what are we going to do about it? What are we going to, how are we going to take charge of the narrative? Not by following Andrew Tate and so on, but I suppose by, uh, by doing the opposite of the materialist, by not promoting orange Bugattis, what color is your Bugatti, but by rather promoting, you know, uh, how, did you, how, how did you overcome your fears? Or what fears are you going to overcome next? That's what we should be talking about. How are we going to stop being afraid of getting organized? How are we going to stop caring about what other people think of us, you know, as white people, basically? And how are we going to tell ourselves that we have every right to do whatever we can do? Whatever we can do, we may do. And we're going to do it for reasons, right? Our spiritual revival, as I spoke about earlier, right? That's what it's all about, yeah. Does Russia support the Palestinians? Yeah. There's a there's a couple of million Jews in Israel who have Russian ancestry. The Russian speaking Jewish, uh, the Russian speaking Jews, they're like two million or one and a half million or so. It's the second largest spoken language in Israel is actually Russian. After Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. But I don't trust Putin. It's not like I'm for Putin. I'm not. I think Putin is also a Kabbalist, like all the others, you know, like Xi and like, uh, you know, Biden isn't in charge, obviously, but whoever is pulling Biden's strings is. They're all Kabbalists. Are white people ever going to leave Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa or North America? Probably not. You know, a portion will stay and have their own ethno states, like in the Orania. We'll see how it goes. You know, what's the bigger plan here? If the world is just a giant chessboard, what are we fighting for? Just for global dominance? I say we can do something else, and instead of aiming for being the global rulers, we become the rulers of of Europe, basically. Yeah? in the sense that we constantly uh, push back against globalism. Our my idea is that we become a sort of separatist, uh, sorry, a separatist race of people who successfully separate from globalism and successfully live on, meaning always, always being the uh, always being the insult to injury to globalist injury, meaning that the globalists will will always hate us for the fact that we're not uh, participating with them anymore. I think that would be a really great goal if we can have uh, Europe as our fallout base because Europe is ours, right? And we use the people in the colonies either come back here to help defend Europe, that's the first plan, and then we can then in turn help people in the colonies again, right? Uh, a quid pro quo situation between Europeans and, uh, and white people outside of Europe. Right. What do you think of Netanyahu? He was secret service. Yeah, he's a very ruthless man. He feels extremely superior. But then again, I don't think he's super smart or something. He is in a way also just a political puppet nowadays. Yeah? There are people telling him what to do, you know. So, you know, if an actual white country existed, it would support Palestine. Well, Ireland supports Pal Palestine, see, because the Irish are Catholics and they've been oppressed, oppressed by the British. So they feel some uh, kinship with the Palestinian cause. So, but then of course... Muslims go to Ireland and they stab Irish children to change their mind, right? That's not a very good idea, you know? Yeah, well, so far I don't get banned on uh, TikTok Live, but rather uh, my, re my regular videos get, uh, get taken down frequently, especially when they go viral. People are so, so sensitive. I, hard, I never report people's videos. I just block people or I just move on. I just... I don't, uh, I don't stay, uh, you know, I don't stay angry <laughs> at videos I've seen, you know, that's just not how it works, you know. Yeah, the painter, yeah. I read some of uh, the painter's speeches. There's a, the whole, a whole compendium, what's it called, by Max Domaris. I'll type the name here. Max Domaris. It's also available in translation, I believe. It's in four volumes, the translation of all the speeches. And the speeches are, well, in a way, much more revealing, better, quote unquote, than the book. Because in the speeches, he really explains over and over and over again 
that Bolshevism, the Bolshevik atheist communism, is a threat to Europe and is going to become something like a religion. And it has. Atheism, atheist communism, materialism has become the religion of Europe nowadays and of the Western world. Yeah, and that this was what he was fighting. He was trying to keep Europe religious and Christian, Catholic perhaps even. Yeah. And so the Germans, the German soldiers, they didn't believe they were fighting Jews. They thought they were fighting the communists, the Bolshevik. You know, the Russian Bolshevik communists who were threatening to invade Europe. Stalin had 30 million Russian soldiers on hand to invade Europe. And even though the Russians did not invade Western Europe, uh, communism did. Brussels is a communist enterprise. The European Union is a communist system. It's so strange that the, after World War II, the American leadership became communist. How did that happen? Yeah. It's really strange, you know. Yeah, Ireland is suffering mass immigration as well, you know, also from... Uh, uh, the question is, why don't Muslims just from Europe go to Israel? You know? Oh, you have this book by Max Damaris? Okay, great, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was very, very insightful. This is the book where they really explained the worldview and what they really stood for and so on. Got mit uns here. Yeah. I need a little sip. How did American policy turn communist? I don't know. I think the people in charge there are just madmen. And it's not Biden, it's whoever's behind uh, the leadership, right? The real leadership in the USA today is the Obama administration. Biden is just a puppet. And then you have tons of Black Panthers, the communists, the Marxists, and so on. They're all working together against, basically. You see, they see the white middle class because the white middle class actually has more savings than the U.S. banks combined do. So the white middle class is extremely wealthy in this sense. But uh, they have no leadership, no organization. All right. And so they see the white middle class as cattle that they wish to slaughter or cows to milk. They want to milk the white middle class dry, take all the money and then use that money to build something like the global open society and push the rules based order, uh, the new world order. Yeah. And that's so strange, you know, that the white middle class today in the USA still has the potential to be the most powerful force in that country but they, they don't have the right leadership. You know, you, you get your, uh, your Vivek and your uh, <laughs> Nimarata, Nikki Haley, you know, you get your Indian and your Pakistani people. Where are your own people? I, I felt Ron DeSantis is also pro-Israel, of course, but Ron DeSantis doesn't seem to have the skill really to, uh, he's, not, he's not genuine, at least in his social interactions. But anyway, you know, you need... Uh, Someone, someone in the USA needs to rise up to this challenge to be the leader of the white middle class. Even if you are an electoral minority, you still need somebody to organize you, to get you together, and basically take charge of whatever you feel is worth defending. All right? Nick Fuentes. <laughs> I was thinking like a very different style of person would, would rise to the scene, you know? <laughs> ben Shapiro, sure. Okay. Uh, if I can think of an example, I don't know. Uh, well, preserving an autonomous race in a new world that is linked with technology is not sustainable. Yeah, yes, it is because you can separate. You know, the the Mennonites and the Amish are doing fine. They're thriving without technology and um, that's perhaps how we can also do it no one says you have to go along with the program that's given to you the program of materialism and technology where we always just keep doing what our teachers tell us to do and the teachers take their hints from the from the guidebook the teacher's handbook that is written by the government right and the governments they take their cues from the world economic forum and, all, and the tri uh, the trilateral committee and so on whatever 
and the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR in the USA. And so you end up, you know, nobody really thinks about, you know, hey, wait a minute, we don't have to do any of this. <laughs> we can literally revolt against the modern world. Yeah. How are we going to stop mass immigration to the West though? Well, you know, if as soon as the welfare dries up, they will they will stop coming, they'll be gone. But you know, we need to focus on controlling the resources, like I mean I mean water and fertile land and defend those resources. And then perhaps realize that we may end up in a war not with Europe against Russia, but rather with the the the, the countryside and the cities. The cities are the real enemy, in my view, because you have all these hyper specialized people there who are who are now electoral majority. So they always win in every election. Every election is now an urban win. The cities win. Right. And so what you might need to realize is that uh, in order to take things back to the way things were in the 19th century, where you had an aristocracy, a fighting nobility. Right. Uh, you might need to take out the cities. I think I've already spoken about this before, you know. Do you think the 40s will repeat itself in some kind of way where Europeans rise up? Yeah. Uh, recently, I found an article, a news article uh, uh, about what happened during the early 1930s in Berlin. The German women were hungry and then they decided to march through women, right? The German women started, decided to march through the rich neighborhoods of Berlin looking for the uh, finance minister. And then they got into a fight with the police and the women actually beat the police on their heads with their empty baskets, their empty food baskets. That's how it started. I mean, we make the Germans out to be this race of monsters and evil Nazis. But really, it was simply hungry women who couldn't feed their children anymore. They were the ones, they were the first ones who took to the streets. The German, the hungry German women who couldn't feed their kids. They started looking for the rich finance minister and they're in the rich neighborhoods and they demanded something be done and they voted for the painter. Right? That's how it got started. So I've said this many times, many times before, is that Europe, European people will not do anything until they go hungry. And I can't wait. I can't wait for that moment in time where people go hungry. It gets cold. Kids can't get housing and jobs anymore. They've got nothing to eat. And then we can we have a window of opportunity to very rapidly seize power right and or hungry people are easily organized because if they're all hungry they need to eat within a few days right they will do what a leader tells them to do we're going to take back our land right we're going to organize the countryside to feed everybody and in, in exchange for that we're going to clean house clean house we're going to clean europe up flush europe out Flush it out to sea. We have we've got the Rhine River neatly positioned to flush a lot of shit out to sea. So that's what it's all about, you know. Yeah, Vivek says the great replacement is actually happening. So why doesn't he go to India then, you know? An Indian cannot save America because their loyalty. He is also a puppet, firstly, and secondly, he's not an American. He's a, he's an Indian person, right? Their loyalty is not with the white middle class. They don't give a damn about you. They want your money and give it to the people in India and then make America Indian. You know, you know what this is all about? The State Department is involved in this. Rishi Sunak, you know, and then uh, Leo Varadkar in Ireland. And then you have uh, you have this Muslim guy who hates white people. Did you know that the prime, the first minister of Scotland actually hates white people? He's a racist who hates white people. Right? And then you have Vivek and you have Nimarata, Nikki Haley. Why do they do that? It's because the United States cannot win a war against both Russia and China unless the Indian and the Pakistani soldiers help them fight this war. Because there's just not enough white people, white men willing to die in these wars anymore. So they're going to try to get Africans and India and Pakistani people to do the dying for US empire. And you know what's so silly? They actually will do it if you pay them enough. And that's why they need to rob the white middle class to give the money to the mercenaries from India so that the Indian people will go to war with China. It's pathetic, but that's how it is. You know, 
what about Kanye? He's bonkers nuts. D don't pay attention to people like that, you know? Yeah, well, America is also turning into the, into the Weimar Republic. You know, you're gonna have this say we already we already have it anyway. What was the Weimar Republic anyway? It was this super socialist society where the women were starving, so they started doing porn and prostitution, right? And, and transgenderism and so on, and, and the deconstruction of family. All this stuff happened already, and we're living in the same kind of situation now. So it makes sense that the United States. Uh, will turn into something like, you know, what the Germans had after in the, in the 1930s. But, you know, is it going to be an Indian Hitler who is going to kill off the white middle class or is it going to be a white middle class leader who is going to cleanse the USA? Which way is it going to be, you know? Aren't we all nuts if we criticize Israel? Israel, yeah. If you criticize Israel according to Nikki Haley, then you're an anti-Semite. That's weird, you know. Yeah, I know. What can we do? We can prepare and wait for the right time when the Europeans go hungry. Then we have a window of opportunity to fight back, to get organized, and start cleaning house. All right, I'm going to log off. So you can go to my uh, Substack newsletter at the great www.jmk.info. I don't know if the sound was awfully loud because I didn't check the... No, it must be all right, I suppose. Uh, you can go to my Twitter at JohannesMKX. And of course, I have my YouTube where I will repost this video at the great Johannes. You know, thank you very much. And I'll probably see you tomorrow again.